Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for joining this session. My name is Leon Navi, and I'm a senior software engineer at Consalco Group. The company provides open source consultancy services. But I'm here today to speak about uh, my hobby. And my hobby is related to making open source uh, hardware add-on bo boards for Raspberry Pi. Therefore, I would like to share with you my experience. Uh, I'm living in Europe, in Bulgaria. This is far, far away. I even didn't realize how far away is this by the time when I applied for a speaker at the Embedded Linux Conference and the Open IoT Summit. The agenda for today, the agenda for today includes um, uh, a little bit of information about open source hardware, and after that, um, overview about the Raspberry Pi hat, which is a standard of the Raspberry Pi Foundation for making add-on boards for Raspberry Pi. We'll go into details how you can make your own um, open source hardware add-on boards. P hat, which is a simplified version of, of the standard. And after that, I'll share some of the ex practical experience that I have in designing open source hardware. Keep in mind that I'm a software engineer. Uh, I only recently bought a soldering iron. So, you know, the combination between software engineer and a soldering iron can make a lot of dangerous prototypes. <laughs> so beware each of my words and <laughs> double check them. I'm just sharing my experience and the keyword for this talk is definitely hobby. Finally, we'll, we'll speak a little bit uh, about the software support for Raspberry Pi and how after you have uh, an add-on board, how to adjust the software for it. So how many of you are familiar with open source hardware as a concept? Could you please raise your hand? OK, that's perfect. Open source hardware is not that different uh, from the open source so software. The idea is that um, it's a concept for providing the design of the physical objects so other people can study them, reproduce them, modify them, distribute them, even sell them. Definitely open source hardware is not for everyone, but especially for hobby projects, it's great uh, to have experience with, with it. Just like in open source software, uh, there are a number of licenses for uh, open source hardware. Just, this is just a small portion of the open source hardware licenses. I think that these are some of the most popular. As you can see, some of the open source software licenses can be also used for open source hardware. So why Raspberry Pi? Um, the answer is that this is probably the most popular single board computer on the market. Uh, it's very low cost. A lot of people have it. Uh, students love it. Hobbies love it. We, the software developers, love it as well. There is a decent software support and a huge community. But the disadvantage is that it is not open source hardware. Is there anyone in the room who does not have a Raspberry Pi? Anyone? OK, perfect. You are the perfect audience. Um, Raspberry Pi has a long history. And at the beginning of this talk, I would like to share with you some milestones uh, which are important for this talk. So the Raspberry Pi Foundation was uh, established in 2009. But the first uh, Raspberry Pi models appeared in 2012 on the market. Uh, initially, the, the first version was announced in 2011, but the manufacturing was a little bit slowed down. In 2014, something very important related to this talk happened. The Raspberry Pi model B Plus appeared. And uh, this model brings a lot of significant changes, especially for add-on boards. That's why this is a milestone important for our talk right now. Uh, last year, Raspberry Pi Foundation announced the Zero. This is a, ver a small version of Raspberry Pi that costs just five US dollars, but it's like a unicorn. It's very hard to, to get one. Do, do you have a Raspberry Pi Zero? OK, well done. <laughs> so Raspberry Pi, as you probably all of you know, um, comes in different flavors. Uh, this here is the very first version. That, was, that appeared in 2012. And after that, we've ha we have Model B+, the second version of Raspberry Pi, the third version, as well as the Compute Stick, which is a kind of attempt of the Raspberry Pi Foundation to go for more 
industrial markets and the Raspberry Pi Zero that we have already discussed. After 2012, in the past year, uh, in the past five years, a lot of individuals or companies were making add-on boards. And basically, if you want to do uh, Internet of Things with Raspberry Pi, you need an add-on board. It could be a sensor, it could be a whole kit that you just attach on top of your Raspberry Pi, various shapes, various, uh, uh, various fa form factors, and uh, various software support. Uh, it could be a little messy if you want to, comp to, com to combine all of these things in a, single, in a single device. So Raspberry Pi Foundation decided to bring some order. And in 2014, they announced the um, Model B Plus of Raspberry Pi. It's still the first version. It's still the same system, uh, the same system on the chip but there are some significant changes. From the perspective of a user, probably the most important changes are the new USBs and the, the change of locations of the connectors, such as the HDMI, some connectors were removed, and so on. Um, but actually, the most important and significant change, in my opinion, is that Model B Plus has 40-pin header instead of the 26 pins that were existing on the first Raspberry Pi model. So now let's have a look at the previous slide, but this time I have highlighted the boards that have 40 pin header. So these are the boards with 40 pin header starting from model B+, the second version of Raspberry Pi, the third version, and the zero, it also has 40 pin header. Let's have a closer look at these these 40 pins. So the first 26 pins are exactly the same as the one uh, as the pins of the first version of Raspberry Pi. So if you have an add-on board that is already compatible with um, the first version of Raspberry Pi, you can just attach it to the new new models, and it will work out of the box, no problem. But what we have here are 40 new pins. The majority of these pins, uh, 14 new pins. The majority of these pins are general purpose input output pins. There are a few grounds. And most importantly for this particular talk is the secondary I squared C bus, which is located on pin 27 and 28. Following the announcement of the Raspberry Pi 1 Model B Plus, Raspberry Pi Foundation made another announcement for something called Raspberry Pi hats. Uh, there is a very nice blog article um, published at raspberrypi.org that explains the standard and how you can make your own Raspberry Pis. This happened in 2014. So let me clarify something. Hat and Raspberry Pi hat are totally different things. Uh, so this is the Raspberry Pi Sense hat, one of the first hats, and hat uh, stands for hardware attached on top. Basically, this is an add-on board that you place on top of your Raspberry Pi. And in this presentation, I'll try to explain you how you can create uh, hardware attached on top for your Raspberry Pi, and this way to create Internet of Things. Are you familiar with the uh, Raspberry Pi head requirements and the standard? Have you done any heads? Anyone? Am I the only one? OK, good. Ideally, after this talk, you got inspired, you go back home, you grab the soldering iron, and you do your first Raspberry Pi hat, OK? You didn't seem very enthusiastic right now, but <laughs> I hope that by the end of the talk, it will be different. Can you show us how to solder, too? I beg your pardon? Can you show us how to solder, too? Uh, I'm a software engineer. <laughs> <laughs> So the, the first thing from the requirements is the form factor and the dimensions. They are set to 65 by uh, 56 millimeters. And the form factor of the head uh, should leave space for the monitor and the camera that you can attach to your Raspberry Pi. Uh, we have already discussed in details the 40-pin header. And one of the requirements is that your add-on board that is called a head should be compatible with these 40 pins. 
Last but not least, and actually very important, there is an EEPROM with a device tree fragment that should be placed on your head. The details are available here. This is an article from the Raspberry Pi Foundation. By the way, my slides have been already uploaded at the website of this conference, as well as in SlideShare. So um, I'll share the links at the end of the, the presentation. So um, does it mean that you can do a board that does not follow this standard? Yes, of course, you can. No problem to do it. You can still do any kind of uh, add-on boards for Raspberry Pi. It doesn't matter if it follows these requirements or not. But if you want to call your board ahead, then you have to comply with these things. Later on, um, a company, a UK company called Pimeroni came with another standard which is not official, but it's simpler. It's called PHAT. Um, the form factor is suitable for Raspberry Pi Zero, which means it's um, just 30 millimeters uh, height. It has four mounting holes, and there is a four-pin through-hole header, just like for the head. The difference is that the EEPROM is not mandatory. As a software engineer, I really enjoy having this EEPROM with the device tree fragment, but this is obviously not the case for all people. I'll explain you in details the EEPROM in the next slides. So following the, the release of the standard, the first add-on board was the Sense Hat. Uh, you probably have seen it. This is a photo of Raspberry Pi with the Sense Hat attached on top of it. This is an official product of the Raspberry Pi Foundation. It includes a bunch of sensors, including sensors for temperature, humidity, barometric, barometric pressure, accelerometer, and so on. There are also RGB LEDs, eight rows, eight columns, and there is a five-button joystick over here. Um, in general, the idea was that the Raspberry Pi Foundation announced this as part of an initiative for students in the UK to develop software written in Python. And the best uh, software solutions with the Raspberry Pi Sense head uh, have been sent to space thanks to a British astronaut. Uh, after that, this um, product was um, on sale through distributors of uh, Raspberry Pi, such as Element 14 and Farnell. So that's how I got one, and I started prototyping with it. By that time, I was just a software engineer, wanted to make some um, you know, hobby internet of things, and I was searching for off-the-shelf hardware that just works. But obviously, the sense head was not, uh, was not the perfect solution for my ideas. So I started wondering, how can I make something different. How can I make my own hardware? Is it that difficult to do it? One of the problems that I had with the sense head was that I was using the temperature sensors, but since the Raspberry Pi was making some um, big computations, the CPU load was very high, and after, at the end of the day, the data coming from the temperature sensor was not accurate because of the heating uh, made by the CPU. So. The sense head is not the only add-on board for Raspberry Pi. There are hundreds of boards. Nowadays, everyone is making a board. So before making your own board, it's good to, to check if someone has already done it. And the easiest way that I found out for checking Raspberry Pi boards is this really nice website called Raspberry Pi Pinout, where you can find information about the 40-pin header of the new Raspberry Pis as well as a list of a lot of devices that have been already created. Uh, this is a community website. Volunteers are maintaining it. So if you want, you can add more boards. And eventually, if you got inspired, if you create your add-on boards for Internet of Things for Raspberry Pi, you should go here and list your board as well. So now I would like to share with you the basic steps for making your first Raspberry Pi hat. By the way, I forgot to ask you at the beginning of the presentation, how many of you are software engineers? Okay, and how many of you are hardware engineers? Okay, a few of them, a few of you. Okay, so the hardware engineers could help me right now with these slides. The software engineers, hopefully you'll get inspired, right? So first you need an idea. Um, it's better to have a simple idea for the beginning, right? The best example is a blinking LED. It's easy to do it, and you can do it fast. You need a soldering equipment, obviously. I'm using a hobby soldering equipment from a company called Olimex. Uh, 
they have a headquarter in my hometown, Plovdiv, Bulgaria, so this was the easiest option. I, I went there, bought my first soldering iron from them, and it's quite decent for the small stuff that I do. Um, so in order to start making your hat, I recommend you to get a proto hat from Adafruit. It basically already has the EE prom. Actually, you can buy it with or without the EE prom. It's up to you. Uh, but it has the size, the, the form factor for a Raspberry Pi hat, so it's an easy beginning. Uh, you also need additional hardware resources. If you're making a blinking LED hat, you just need the LED and a few resistors. So it's, a, in, it's an easy choice. So once you have soldered everything, it's time to, to flush the device tree fragment on the EE prom. Are you familiar with device trees? Okay, so um, the device tree is um, a data structure that contains the hardware description, and it could be read from the software side. Uh, the idea is that the device tree has a DTS file, which, is, uh, which contains a tree of nodes and properties. Each property can um, contain uh, name value pairs, and different nodes can either have uh, subnodes or other properties. Uh, the idea is that with a device tree, you can use the same uh, kernel. That's once it's compiled, you can use it with a wider variety of um, devices using the same uh, system on a chip. Uh, it's very convenient if you have uh, similar devices with uh, different peripherals. And in, the, in our particular case, the add-on board that we are creating is a peripheral device. So on the EE Prom, we're gonna flash a device tree fragment, and during booting, the device tree fragment information will be read, and after that, you'll see how you can read it from the software side. So this is some kind of a bridge between the hardware and the software. According to the Raspberry Pi Foundation, the recommended EEPROM is this one, CAT24C32, but if you are unable to find it, don't worry, you just can uh, find uh, another one that has uh, s similar specifications, uh, if it's easier for you to use another one uh, or to get another one, just go for it, no problems. So the flashing of the EEPROM happens in few easy steps, and you can even do it on, on your Raspberry Pi. Actually, that's what I'm doing. So Raspberry Pi Foundation has a GitHub account over here, and there is a, a Git repository called HETS. You, you should go there, uh, check out the source code, and build a tool called EEPROM UTOs. After building, uh, the build procedure is super simple. You just have to type make and you have it. After that, you have to create a simple text description of your add-on board. Uh, in, in this text file, you should describe uh, which uh, pins of the Raspberry Pi header are you using. Uh, there is an example an example text file called eeprom-settings.txt. You can just copy it, adjust it, depending on uh, the uh, capabilities of your add-on board. And then to generate an eep file using a tool called eep-make. Finally, you should flush the eeprom to your, uh, fl sorry, finally you should flush the binary file generated on the previous step to your eeprom. And for that, there is another uh, script, a bash script that you can run. The easiest way to do this uh, for hobbyists is just to use your Raspberry Pi. So Raspberry Pi has two I squared uh, C buses. And if you want to flush something, you should use pins three and five. Uh, this is the primarily I squared uh, uh, C bus. And I created for my own needs a very simple add-on board just for flushing the EE prompts since I'm uh, doing a true hole. Uh, mounting of uh, the EE prompts. This was a really easy option. From the left side, I have uh, a setup for flushing the EE prompt, and when I'm done, I'm just uh, putting the EE prompt on the other side. It, this is a small breadboard, so it's easy, really easy to move it around just to, to verify that uh, the EE prompt has been successfully uh, written. Sorry, could you please repeat? If you, if you had a board soldered up, you wouldn't be able to move the EEPROM to the other pin, so why not just flash it to the second set? 
yeah, that, that's also possible. If you, if you have a separate flusher for uh, EEPROMs, yes, that's a, also an option. Or if you are making a, uh, if you have to manufacture a lot of the Raspberry Pi out on boards, it's better to use uh, an EEPROM uh, for a, a surface mounting technology. That would be faster, of course. Yeah, but I mean, if you use the second I2C, yeah. that it's already wired to. On the, board. Uh, the wiring is a little bit different. I've got a, a couple of resistors here, so what I'm doing, I'm just flashing in, and after that, moving it to the other side of the, this uh, prototype board that I created with my bare hands just for flashing. But initially, there are so many ways to flush it, yeah, so. Um, after booting the board with your EEPROM, this is what is going to happen. You have a device called proc device tree slash head, and in this directory, you have a bunch of files that you can see over here. These files are read from the device tree fragment that is in the EEPROM. So if you have uh, correctly created the device tree fragment and flushed it to the EEPROM, this is going to be the result. Um, this is a small project that I'm having for uh, open source hardware infrared uh, small head. Uh, this is uh, the P hat standard, but I put an EEPROM because I just like to have the, inf the information about the hardware from the software side. So this is going to be the end result. So now I would like to move on to, uh, to a kind of a deep dive from the perspective of software engineer into hardware stuff. Uh, I explained you how you can do your first prototype with soldering and a proto head for Adafruit. But now let's talk about making something more uh, professional and making a PCB. Um, have you used any of these tools, KiCad, Ego, or something else? How many of you are using KiCad? Okay, and how many of you are using Ego? Okay, so as I said, I'm a software engineer, so I had a pretty much zero experience with any of these suits. And, um, Actually, these are not the only one. It's uh, full of uh, very professional and more expensive design automation suits. But keep in mind that, as I said at the beginning of the talk, the keyword here is hobby, okay? So for hobbyists, the two most popular options are KiCad and Ego. And KiCad is a free and open source software that runs on Linux. And since I'm a Linux user, and since I did not have any previous um, experience with any of this software, the, the the choice for me was pretty easy. I went to KiCad. Furthermore, uh, a company in my hometown, Olimex, that is making open source hardware design, is using KiCad, and they were kind enough to, to make a few um, community uh, presentations to introduce uh, our local community to KiCad, and that's how I got inspired. Ego, on the other hand, is, um, is a more professional tool. It's free for small two layers PCB, but they recently switched their licensing model uh, from uh, to, subs to a subscription model, so it's a, it's a little bit more complicated from business sides of thing with Ego. For if you are a hobbyist and if you don't have experience, just like me, use KiCad. Otherwise, it's um, picking up the design automation suite. It's a little bit of, like a religion. So if you have your favorite tool, just go for it. Of course. As I said, I'm using KiCad, therefore I would like to share with you a little bit of information, what are the advantages of KiCad? As I said, it's a free and open source software tool. It's available under the GPL version three license. It's cross-platform, which means that you can use it on your favorite GNU Linux distribution, but you can also use it uh, with Microsoft Windows or Mac OS. It uh, had a pretty decent integrated 3D viewer, and furthermore, Auto routing because the routing is a little bit tricky, especially for people for beginners like me. Uh, KiCad is being developed very actively in the past couple of years, primarily by contributions from CERN developers. And as I said, it is now used by Olimex for designing their new open source hardware boards. I saw an eight layer board that I designed with KiCad, so this is a good sign that KiCad is ready even for industry use. If you are designing a head template, and after all, this is the focus of the, of the talk, you should get a, I recommend you to get a template. If you don't like templates, you can do it on your own, of course, but using a template will save you some time, at least for the edge uh, cutches and the placement of the EEPROM. 
I found uh, a few templates that are available for both KiCad and Ego. If you're using a different type of a software, probably there is, a, there is a template for it as well. But here are some of the templates that I have found, a couple of them for, for KiCad and one for Ego. So these are my products, <laughs> my hobby product, pro products. The first one is a general purpose flexible head. Uh, with a bunch of stuff. As a software engineer, I wanted to, to be able to easily plug in um, uh, different sensors over the I squared C. There is a relay, there is an infrared, there is an option to add a, a modular display, one of these simple displays that you can get from almost uh, everywhere, dirt cheap displays, RGB LED and a buzzer. Uh, both of these, um, these uh, add-on boards are entirely open source. They're published in GitHub. And um, my friends helped me a lot with the first head. So the second one, I decided to, 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 to do a better version, improved version for infrared. I did it last month as part of preparation to this talk. And uh, it's a, the P-head form factor, very similar again. Again, designed with KiCad and again, uh, entirely open source hardware available at GitHub. This is how KiCad looks. Uh, this is, these are. All the uh, layers are, almost all the layers are, are enabled here, and this is your work environment. Um, as a software engineer, I would say that using uh, software like this is a little bit like, you, you should learn the, the hotkeys and the, all the menu options, so it could take you some time to get started, but it's not as hard as I initially thought, so give it a try. A few recommendations, uh, as you can guess, um, I was a beginner with the open source hardware and with the hardware design, so I made a few mistakes over the time. So um, I would like to share with you some recommendations just to make sure that you save time and will not repeat my mistakes. Um, first of all, you should pick up your PCB manufacturer and each PCB manufacturer has uh, different requirements for trace spaces, drills, and so on. So make sure that while you're designing your hardware, you are complying with the minimal requirements of your PCB manufacturer. Uh, keep in mind uh, the complexity of the assembly of the board, because sometimes uh, if you don't place well the components, it could take you a lot of time to solder the prototypes, and, it, and the manufacturing could be diff difficult. Also, you should consider the location of the components that you place on your hat uh, in terms of the components that already exist on the Raspberry Pi. Um, I, had to, I have to confess that the first versions of my very first board uh, had a potential me meter just above the HDMI display, and I had also a button. So sometimes when I was pressing the button, the potential meter was uh, making a contact with, G with the HDMI, and my Raspberry Pi was rebooting. Really bad experience. <laughs> so the solution was pretty simple. I just move the potentiometer away from the HDMI, but just keep in mind that in this particular case, you are designing an add-on board, so you should know the, the Raspberry Pi below the, the add-on board. So once you have the design, you should go to prototyping. And there are at least three options, or I have tried three options for making the PCB design. I know that some people are making PCB, are manufacturing PCB at home. Yes, it's possible. I've seen this in YouTube, but this is quite of a challenge. So I decided to use some professional help here. And one of the options is actually made in the United States, uh, OSH Park. Rufustini over there is from OSH Park. They provide an awesome service. This is the first board that I had. Uh, OSH Park is providing service exactly for people like me. At that time, I had zero experience, so it was very difficult to understand what exactly I need. But OSH Park have a very user-friendly interface where you just upload the Gerber files, uh, very reasonable pricing. Uh, it's, it's fantastic quality. And in a few weeks, you'll get uh, your pro first prototypes uh, delivered in your uh, uh, mailbox. Alternatives are, of course, China. It's always, uh, in China, you, you know, we can always find cheaper things, uh, bigger quantity. And the, the third alternative is to do something local. Uh, as I said, I'm living in Europe, so local for me means probably a different thing for, for local for you. 
but yes, uh, in, in, it appears that uh, there are a lot of companies making PCB design. And nowadays, I switch to uh, local Bulgarian companies. So I'm living in this city called Plovdiv. And uh, I'm proud to say that my boards are fully designed and assembled in, in Plovdiv. Uh, is there a question up there? Yeah? Uh, sorry, I wasn't able to hear you well. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. That, that's by design. The, the head, uh, sorry, just to repeat uh, the question, uh, it's actually an observation that most of these heads uh, go uh, on top of the CPU, so that could uh, lead to uh, heating problems. And yes, uh, that's true. You have to keep it in mind. Um, Depending on the application that you would like to run on your Raspberry Pi, uh, you can add a heat sink just to reduce a little bit the, uh, the, the heating of the CPU. So uh, I would like to share with you a little bit of information about software. Since the majority of you are software developers, I believe it's easy for you to handle this part. Um, it appears that Python is the most popular programming language for Raspberry Pi. Uh, since I was doing Raspberry Pi open source hardware and software boards, uh, I sent a few of the prototypes that I had to community members around Raspberry Pi. And one of the first feedback was that at that time I had um, some basic software written in C just to show how my add-on board works. And the feedback was, well, we need something in Python. You need to do it in Python. So if you're making, a, if you're making an add-on board for Raspberry Pi, consider writing at least the examples in Python. There is a great library called uh, Wiring Pi. It's um, very easy to use from C and C++. And there are a lot of bindings of Wiring Pi for the most popular programming languages, uh, f languages like Java or Node.js and JavaScript, PHP, Perl, or even modern languages such as Go and Rust. Of course, there is a bunch of other open source tools that you can use depending on the components that you have on top of your Raspberry Pi. And one more thing, uh, keep in mind to share the hardware and the software under open source licenses. This is great for the community. And Raspberry Pi is pretty much uh, about communities, community projects. Thank you very much. These are some of the useful links that I've uh, used while I was working on these slides. And we still have 15 minutes for questions. Any questions? Anyone? Have you tried both of those uh, uh, layout tools? Uh, did you try both of them, or do you only use Keycat? OK, so the question is, have I tried both Ego and Keycat? And the answer is no. I have uh, tried only Keycat, uh, just because it was hard enough to, to learn one, one of them. Probably in future, I might try uh, Ego. But uh, since I'm, a, I'm, I'm having Ubuntu on my laptop, and I prefer something that's for sure uh, runs on, runs on Linux, new Linux distributions. Furthermore, I was encouraged by the presentations of uh, this company that I mentioned, Open, uh, Olimex, uh, because they were um, sharing uh, tips and tricks how to use KiCad. So, uh, it was easier for me to get started with KiCad. Yeah, I was just curious if anyone could uh, compare them. Okay, so um, the question is, uh, is anyone uh, capable of comparing this? I'm sorry that I cannot provide an answer since I don't have a, a experience with Ego, but maybe someone else in the room can provide information?
Polymex um, just designed a Gallwinner A64 uh, laptop uh, with, um, with uh, the latest version of PiPad. So um, that's kind of a good example of what you can do with it. You can do a full board with DDR memory and everything with it now. So uh, it's got a lot of capability. Eagle just got sucked in. And that's why they changed their licensing model to subscription. Uh, but uh, I would like to add that, yeah, it's very true that Ego has, uh, the free version of Ego has these restrictions about the board size and the number of layers. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that they allow up to four layers for the free version, right? I, I, I can't remember. Yeah, I think it's four layer boards. And the size, I don't remember the exact restrictions for the size, but the Raspberry Pi heads are good to go with, with the free version of uh, Ego. Yeah. Like yeah. It's more than enough for a. Uh, yeah. Podcasts, you know, apps, no problem. Yeah, so if, you, if someone has experience with Ego, you, definitely the free version will be good enough to, to make uh, these type of boards. All of the boards that we have approved to make sure are done in Ego. Just to repeat that, uh, uh, the information is that all the boards that Adafruit makes are designed with Eagle. Um, any other questions? Any other topics to discuss? Yes? So you ended up doing a uh, crowd money campaign with one of these boards, right? And I was just wondering if you had any insights into that process. There's probably people that might have ideas of products they want to make and maybe aren't sure if they should go oh, ahead and try and do that, you know? Yes. So, uh, since we know each other with Drew, he knows that I did a small crowdfunding campaign in Indiegogo. The thing with hardware is that when you design, um, when you have a hobby to make open source software at home, you basically create a GitHub account, uh, put your software there, and you have users out of the box because other developers and users will come to GitHub, grab the source code, and use it. It's a little bit different when you have a physical product because um, even if you have the design, uh, you still need someone to manufacture it uh, for you. And in most of the cases, you cannot manufacture a single board. You have to manufacture at least a few of them. Uh, so yeah, I did an Indiegogo campaign. Uh, a few people uh, uh, contributed to the campaign. I think I had like 50 people. And it was great because uh, this is an open source project since the, of the beginning. And a lot of people are contributing back uh, experience, uh, sharing what they did with the project, uh, sharing ideas what could be improved. And furthermore, they can even fork the project in GitHub, make their modifications of the KiCad, and produce their own boards based on this design. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, so the question is about the uh, Raspberry Pi pinout. Uh, just to go back a little bit. Okay, this would be faster. Okay. Well, you, you have. Okay, so the question is about the pins available on Raspberry Pi, if I can summarize it, right? So uh, you have power, you have ground, you have a lot of general purpose input outputs. Uh, there is a PWM, uh, it's, on, it's over here. You, you have the, the first I2C squ I bus on pins three and five. Uh, you have SPI as well. Well, if you want, you can use them as a general purpose input output, but some of them have additional features, for example, for SPI or I2C, so it's up to you to decide. Where do I find the list of what those additional features are it's on that website? Uh, it's on the website, but I cannot provide you a direct link at the moment. Okay. I'm sorry that... Uh, I, I tried Googling a little bit. To find uh, well, more. I recommend you to go to this website, a Raspberry Pi Pinout, Exactly, thank you for the help. Yeah, so uh, they have a very good information about the existing add-on boards as well as uh, for the pinout. Thank you for the help.
Oh, this, yeah. Limited, you're just going to have to look at the, the software libraries for how you configure particular pins for particular functions. Yes, yeah. this is uh, very important. For, for some features like the infrared that I'm using, I'm using a Lyric software. This is a very popular open source tool, but I have to make sure that it's uh, properly configured with the proper device tree overlay uh, wallet in order to use the, the, the pins that I have configured uh, in Lyric and within uh, the device tree. Okay, thank, you. thank you. So any other questions? We still have time for at least one question. Oh, I have so many ideas. So the question is, do I have a, a, a new idea? Yes, I have so many ideas. But the thing is that this is a side project. It's an okay. entirely hobby thing. So I have to do well balance between my work and uh, the stuff that I do uh, during the weekends. But yeah, there are a lot of ideas. Furthermore, since the previous projects are open source hardware, a lot of people are commenting and uh, providing suggestions. So yes, it's a. Even for a, such a small project uh, like the one that I did, uh, mm -hmm. people are starting to provide a very good feedback. And uh, this is the magic of open source hardware and open source software. OK, anyone else? Any suggestions, recommendations, or questions? Which distro have you used for OK, the question is, which distro have I used uh, for the prototypes that I do? Uh, Initially, I used Raspbian, uh, because Raspbian is the most popular distribution for Raspberry Pi. It's provided by the Raspberry Pi Foundation, so it's an easy start. Uh, but in general, since uh, as part of my professional work, I have experience with the Yocto project and Open Embedded, uh, I prefer to build my own distribution using the Meta Raspberry Pi layer, uh, which is very well maintained. They have releases uh, following the releases of the Yocto project. So I recommend you to go for your own custom distribution if you are creating a very specific Internet of Things with Raspberry Pi. OK, thank you very much for joining. <laughs>